you're watching online, guys, we are so glad that you're with us. My name is Mark, and myself and my wife, who you saw just a moment ago, we are the lead pastors of Rose, and man, we are excited. We're actually at Cineplex right now. Sorry, I'm just trying to get my iPad going here. Technology is great, but then every once in a while, it doesn't treat you well, so we're good. But uh, we're, we're doing a practice service here at Cineplex for those of you who, online who are like, what's going on? But September 12th, guys, come on. We are launching. Yeah, put your hands together. Get excited. September 12th. We're going we're gonna to be online still, but we're also going to be uh, open to the public to have church here at Scotiabank Theater. And we're so, so excited. Well, I am really, uh, really excited today to preach. And I just believe God wants to do something in our lives no matter where, you, where you're at in life, if you're, if you're feeling good, if you're not feeling good, if things are going great, if things aren't going so great, I, I don't know what's happening in your life, but, but I know God is big enough to come and meet us where we're at, and I think he wants to meet us today. And so I'm excited for what he's going to do. If you have your Bibles, uh, also if you, if you have a notepad, take it out. Take out your phone, take out an iPad, something. Take notes today. Follow along in your Bibles if you have it. Job chapter 1, we're going to be reading verses 7 through 12. I'm going to read this, then we'll pray, then we'll talk a bit about it, and uh, it'll be a great day in church. Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay, Job chapter 1, starting in verse 7, says this. Oh, if you're a new Christian, you might have thought this was Job. When I became a Christian for the longest time, I referred to it as the book of Job, and then I found out it was the book of Job, and I'm like, why? Why? Like, God is a prankster. Anyways, The Lord said to Satan, from where have you come? And Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it. And the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your hand. Only against him do not stretch out your hand. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Very encouraging verse for us in church today. We're going to unpack it. it. It will get better, I promise. But let's pray before we go any further. Jesus Come into this space, come into our hearts, come into our lives right now. We invite you, we make room for you because we want to hear from you. We want you to do a a work in our lives. God, we need you to do a work in our lives. We are powerless to change on our own. We are powerless to grow on our own. We need you. And so God, with a posture of surrender and submission and obedience, we say, we know church can't change us. We know worship can't change us. We know the right actions and attitudes. These things can't change us, but an encounter with your Holy Spirit changes everything. We need you, God. So come, restore us, redeem us, heal us, help us. Give us hope, give us faith, give us vision. We pray this in your name. And all of God's people said, amen, amen. So um, if you, you know me, if you've seen me around, you know I have a, a little girl. I became a dad. And actually, in like a week and a half, I will have become a dad exactly one year ago. We are about to celebrate our daughter, Rome Evie Roslin, uh, her first birthday, which is crazy to think. Like, it's actually bizarre. It's wild to me. Like, where did time go? I remember hearing parents being like, the time flies, the time flies. And I'm like, but does it? And it does. Like, it really does. It's like, man, she was just born, and she had this little newborn diaper, and now she's huge, and she's learning how to walk, and like, it's just wild. But You know, I'll be honest with you, I love that she's growing up. Like, I'm going to miss her little, like, newborn chubby cheeks and all of that stuff. But I look forward to, I said to Roberta the other day, I was like, I cannot wait till Rome is in school. Like, I just can't wait for those moments. I just, I'm looking forward to her growing up and one day her being an adult and having adult conversations. But I just love seeing her grow up and and, and figure things out. And what I love about the age that she is now, she's basically a a one-year-old, she's becoming a lot more interactive with the world. Like she's, she's figuring things out. She's, you know, she's, she's learning, she's observing. She's like, this goes into that and this does that. And she has a memory. She knows where she left things and all of this stuff. It's really cool. And as she's growing up, one of the things I love is as she's interacting with the world, I get to interact with her as well. 
Like before she was just kind of a blob that would lay there and like look at me. But now she can kiss me and hug me and cuddle me and we can play together. And I love playing. Like my favorite hat to wear in, in the whole world is dad. Like I love getting on the floor with Rome and just playing. But it's interesting. I, I look forward to, you know, her growing up more because play right now is really Rome just taking things and breaking them. Like that's really what play is. She'll go to a table and she'll pull everything down on, on the floor. She'll, she'll take a toy and another toy and she'll just smash them together. She is, I, we jokingly and affectionately refer to her as Rome the Destroyer. She loves to break things. She loves to knock things down. And she has these little blocks. And there's about eight or nine of them. And I, one of the, I don't know why I like this. Maybe it's uh, therapeutic or something. But I like building towers with her. So I'll get on the floor. I'll collect all of her blocks. And, and I'll build this tower. And it'll be, I'll put the last block on. And it's nine blocks high. And I kind of take a step back to admire my work. And before I can even appreciate it, she psh, knocks it down. Tower's gone. She just loves to destroy things. She, she has these eggs that go in this little carton, and I put all the eggs in it, and then she immediately grabs it and throws all the eggs everywhere, and they go under the couch and everything. And of course, I love this time, but I look forward to when we can play a little more strategically. But this got me thinking, life is kind of like this, isn't it? Like, it's easy to knock things down. It's easy to have something that's established and then go and, and just break it down. It's really hard to build. It takes time, it takes strategy, it takes effort. Man, I worked hard on that tower that was nine blocks high. I had to make sure they were evenly aligned and then in one foul swoop, Rome knocks it down. Life is like this sometimes, isn't it? We can build things and work on things and strive to be successful and, and, and have accomplishments and accolades and then out of nowhere, It's knocked down. The tower of our lives, the tower of our careers, the tower of our relationships can be knocked down so easily. And this is exactly what happened to Job in the scripture we just read a moment ago. His life was knocked down. So the story, the, the, the story of Job starts in, in, in Job chapter 1, and, and the author of Job tells us that Job was this righteous, upright, he, he, he was a good man. And he was successful. It actually lists everything he owns. He owns livestock. He owns real estate. He has this great family. Uh, the author tells us that no one was greater in his area, in his time, than Job. He, he was this man who feared God. He loved God. And he just happened to come across all of this success. And then where we read, God and Satan are having this conversation. And, 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 and God says, have you considered my, my servant Job? Satan says, well, you've protected him. Of course he's serving you. You've given him wealth and he's accomplished so much. But remove that and I guarantee he will curse you to your face. So God gives him permission, challenging Satan. He's like, no, you don't know Job like I know Job. Job loves me. Job is committed to me. Job, lo Job loves my, my presence more than my presence. My, my presence, my being more than the gifts that I give him. You can try, you can go after him, but I guarantee you he will not curse my name. He will not get angry at me. And sure enough, Satan goes and, and, and Satan destroys everything. That he, he knocks down the tower that is Job's life. Job has 10 children and all of them end up being killed. All of his real estate is burned to the ground. All of his livestock is killed or stolen. And all of a sudden, Job goes from the greatest man in his neighborhood to having absolutely nothing. His tower was knocked down just like that. And then, and, then, and then Satan comes back and, and we see them having a conversation again a little later on. Because, because Job, after this happened, refused to blame God. He refused to get angry at God. So Satan goes back and he's like, of course. A, a man would give anything for his own life because you haven't affected him personally. He doesn't actually care. He's like, people are selfish. People, people are just out for themselves. They just want to, so, so of course. So God says, no, you don't know Job like I know him, man. Like, this is my dude. This is my guy. And so, so, so yeah, you can, you can do what you want to do. You can afflict him with, with illness and, and just spare his life. So Satan goes and he afflicts Job with this illness. And Job, all of a sudden, is in this intense pain. He's lost everything. And now his health, his very health is under attack. Literally everything was robbed from this man. And then the rest of the book of Job is Job's journey. He's wrestling. All he has is his wife and three friends. And basically they're all telling him like, bro, you're a sinner. That's why this has happened to you. Curse God and die. 
but he, he refuses to give into that narrative and he, he wrestles. We see him asking questions and, and praying and lamenting and he's just going through this process, this journey to ultimately come to this conclusion. And I hope and I pray that all of us would come to this conclusion today and it's this, that even when life is bad, God is good. That even when life is bad, God is good. Now let's be honest for a moment. I know we're followers of Jesus. I know life is, you know, supposed to be, how are you doing? I'm, I'm, I'm good. God is, God is good. God is faithful. I'm blessed and highly favored. But let's be honest for a moment. Let's be real for a moment. Life is hard and life sometimes is just bad. Life sometimes just gets bad bad i mean we just walked through and we're continuing to walk through and figure out a whole lot of bad with this with this pandemic with covid with the lockdowns all of that stuff i mean of course god has given us the ability and the perspective to see the good in the midst of it but it's it life is interesting life is a paradox you can be happy and hurting at the same time and i think that's what this last season has been but let's be honest about the bad there have been moments and parts of this that have sucked that have been downright depressing, discouraging, awful. Life sometimes gets bad. We walk through this pandemic, we're still walking through it. I know we're Canadian, but our, our neighbors to the south, their politics, their election, that affects us. And so we're all caught up in the election and the politics that happened recently. The, the racial tension that has taken place uh, to, in, in, in America, but also right here in Canada. We're navigating that, we're trying to figure that out. So much is happening, the economy. It's okay to come to the end of ourselves and be like, man, this is just bad. I don't like this. This isn't good. Life just sometimes gets bad. Life sometimes is just hard. And it's okay to admit that because of course life is hard. Of course life is hard. Do you know that we have enemies? That as followers of Jesus, we have enemies. And when we look at the scriptures, we see that we have three primary enemies. We have the devil. We have the world. And we have our flesh. We have the enemy. The Bible tells us that there is an enemy who prowls around like a lion waiting to devour us. That we are being hunted, that we are being pursued, that we are being stalked. Like there is someone, the enemy, the devil, who is waiting to devour us. In the world, the systems, the structures, people who don't like us, who don't want us to succeed, who are trying to, you know, claw their way up to the top or whatever it may be, the world is sometimes an enemy, and then our own flesh. We are, in fact, our own worst enemies. Our flesh, ourselves, our passions, uh, our urges, our desires, these things that cause us, these, our inclinations that cause us to act and behave a certain way and sometimes act and behave in ways that we don't want to act or behave in. We have these enemies. So, of course, life is hard. And I find it interesting that even though we can identify our enemies, the devil, the world, and the flesh, we still blame God when life gets bad. But all of these things work together to create the perfect storm for trouble. They, they work together and at times we could enter into seasons that are just bad because all of these, these things are coming at us in different ways. You know, the storms of life will come. I think all of us are aware of this. We know it, but we don't actually know it, you know, but we're, we're aware, man, the storm will come. Jesus promised us this. You know, Jesus made a lot of promises in scripture. A lot of promises. And I will give you abundant life. I will give you full life. I will heal the sick. I, I will do miracles in your midst. I will give you purpose. I will give you vision. Follow me and I will give you rest. These are amazing promises and we will hang on to them and pursue them no matter what. God made these promises to us. But Jesus also promised that life would get hard, that life would get bad, that the storms would come. Look at uh, Luke chapter 22, verse 31. He said, uh, Jesus is talking to, to, to Peter. He says, Simon, Simon, that's also Peter's name. He says, behold, Satan demanded to have you. He's coming after you. He wants you. This, this, is, this reminds me of Job, that conversation. Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. Sifting, it's this process of ruining you, undoing you, destroying you. He wants to be your demise. Jesus said, this is going to happen. Satan wants this for you. John chapter 16, verse 33 Jesus said, I have, these thing, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. Okay, we love to focus on, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And that's the part I'm going to focus on, by the way, in my life anyways, when trouble comes. But take heart, I have overcome the world. I've said these things that you may have peace. But the promise here is this, that there will be tribulation. 
that there will be trouble, that life will be, there will be pains and aches and difficulties. There will be disease and sickness and loss. There will be grief and suffering and agony in your life. This is a promise. It is a guarantee. Luke chapter 21, verse 17, Jesus says this, you will be hated. By who? Oh, man, by all. Like all? Yeah, you will be hated by like one person? No, by all for my name's sake. So wait, you're saying that if I want to wave the banner of Jesus' name, I will be hated? Yeah, okay. Is that a guarantee? Jesus is like, yeah, it's a guarantee. Ah, you know, like that's the promise that Jesus makes to us. And when life is bad, even though God has warned us 2,000 years ago, it's so easy to conclude that God is bad. Man, this happened, this bad thing happened because God doesn't care about me. Because he doesn't like me. Maybe he's punishing me. Maybe he's just bad. Maybe he's not who he says he is. Maybe he's not who my parents told me. Maybe that last year when I encountered him and he did all these miracles, maybe that wasn't really God. And we come to the conclusion, man, maybe God is bad. But let me encourage you that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if he was good yesterday, then he's good today. And if he's good today, then he's good tomorrow. God's character, his goodness, his, his, his expression of himself, his personality, his countenance, who he is does not change based on our circumstance or our situation. And when we find ourselves in these seasons, these moments where life is bad, because again, let's just admit, it's okay. Sometimes life gets bad. The only thing we can do is move through the bad towards him who is good. We have to move through the bad. We have to persevere. We have to endure. We have to hang on to faith. We have to hold on to Jesus and just keep moving one step at a time in faith through the bad towards him who is good. And then through this slow, it's often slow. It's often grueling. It's, also, it's often painful. It's, it's this process of healing. God will come and he will rescue us. He will save us. He will restore us. He will heal us. And this is what happened to Job. Job took him on this long process, 42 chapters in the Bible of just learning and figuring out who God is in the midst of chaos, in the midst of pain, in the midst of suffering. And at the end of Job in chapter 42, everything changes. I'm not going to read it, but I encourage you, go read it. But, But God redeems him in a powerful way. But in anticipation of Job 42, Job wasn't there yet. But in Job chapter 13, verse 15, Job says these words. He says, he says, though you slay me, I will hope in you. And how many of us have found ourselves at some point saying, because you've done this, God, I'm done with you. Because you slayed me, because you hurt me, because you didn't meet my expectations, I'm walking away. Not forever, just for a week. I don't want you right now, you know, or maybe we're just like, God, I don't, I don't want you. I don't want to hope in you. What's there to hope in? I don't want to trust in you. I don't want to put my faith in you. You've let me down. Job says these powerful words, though you slay me, I will hope in you. Though I am being undone, I will trust you. Though I am literally being destroyed, My faith will remain in you. Like my life is over as I knew it. But I am not turning my back on you. How is this even possible? Like what is required for us to get to this place like Job? Though you slay me. Though I'm wrecked, I'm being killed, I'm in pain, God, I'm in agony, my my heart is broken, I will hope in you. I've been asking that question, like, how is that even possible? What's required? What's necessary? Job had this overwhelming conviction that God was good. And even though life was bad, he could pursue a good God. He could chase after a good God. He could spend time in the presence of a good God. That this good God would be his refuge. That this good God would be his peace. That this good God would be his escape. This respite. This momentary relief of what he was walking through. 
My life is bad, he said, but my God is good. What else are you going to do when everything around you is bad? You're going to move to the one who is good. We need to fight the urge to do the opposite. When we find ourselves in darkness, we run further into the dark. But the invitation of Jesus is to run into the light, run after, move after the one who is good. I love how Job wrestled, though. This wasn't like Sunday school answer. Pain came Job's way, and he's like, I just need to spend time with Jesus. Like, he wrestled. This was hard for him. 42 chapters of wrestling. It's okay to wrestle. It's okay to question. It's okay to doubt. It's okay to worry. As long as we're moving towards him who is good. And Job ultimately came to this conclusion because he moved towards him who is good. Because he approached God. God, what's going on? I don't understand this. Why did you give me everything simply to take it away? He did his process with God. He did his journey with God. He leaned in. And because he leaned in, he came to this conclusion. Job chapter 19. He makes this statement. He says, for I know that my Redeemer lives. For I know that my Redeemer lives. Band, you can come up. We're going to close in just a few moments. For I know. How do you know that your Redeemer lives? The question just came to my mind. Because you have been redeemed. God can't redeem you if you don't want to be redeemed. So in our moments when we need redemption, we move towards our Redeemer. And we have this incredible testimony, my Redeemer lives. Do you know that God will always, so, so get this, the promise of scripture is there will be pain. People will hate you. People won't like you. There will be suffering. Stuff will happen in your life. But there's the promise that God will always redeem us. That he will always take what the enemy or the world or even ourselves meant for evil and use it for our good. He will redeem it. He is our redeemer. God took Job's brokenness and he redeemed it. He took his pain and he restored it. And some of you here, whether you're in this room, whether you're watching online, like you're going through some very real pain right now. Like you're going through it. Maybe COVID, maybe relationships, maybe job, maybe dreams. I don't know what it may be. I just want to encourage you, like you're not alone. You're not alone in your pain. There is a community that is surrounding you who is here for you. There is a God whose eyes are on you. And he is in the process of redeeming you. And listen, I don't know why what happened to you happened. I don't know what it is. I don't know why it happened. I don't know why it occurred. I don't have that answer. But I do know that my Redeemer lives. I do know that my God is good. I do know that God is in the business of taking our pain and turning it into a platform. That he takes what the enemy meant for evil and he turns it for our good. That he is working all things together for the good of those who love him. I do know that Jesus offers us rest. I do know that Jesus is the Prince of Peace. I do know that in God there is a peace and a calm that is available to us that we can't even comprehend or understand. I don't know why the pain occurred, but I do know that in the midst of that pain, God is with you and God is with me. And it's in these moments as we're about to enter into worship where we get to invite God in, where we get to like Job have, have, have 42 chapters. Maybe today is just one chapter of just walking through processing with God, wrestling with God. He wants to be involved in our lives. He wants to redeem our pain. He loves you. He cares for you. He's passionate about you. He's obsessed with you. And he wants to invade your life today, right now, in this moment, in your living room, in your car, wherever you find yourself, if you're here at Scotiabank Theater. God wants to invade your life and meet with you today. So here in the room, I want to invite you to stand. The team's going to lead us in one final song. I just want to pray for us as we, as we enter into worship. God, I thank you 
I thank you for the life of Job, this example that we have of how you work through our pain, how you work in our pain, how you meet us in the darkest parts of our journeys. And I just pray right now that we would sense you, that we would sense your goodness, that we would feel you, that we would know that you're here with us and that you are good. And God, I just pray for an overwhelming sense of confidence that we would be able to declare my redeemer lives even in the midst of, of the pain, like Job chapter 13, chapter 19, in the middle of it. His eyes are on you. He's moving towards you who is good. And God, would the, would the cry of our hearts be this, though you slay me, though I'm going through it, Though I'm wrestling, though I'm struggling, my hope, my trust, my faith will remain in you. So God, we give you our lives. We give you these moments of worship. And I just pray that you would minister to us right now, that you would begin to heal and restore the broken things in our lives. We love you so much. Pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Let's worship church.